Good morning. Good morning. It is a special day today. We welcome back into the sanctuary those brave enough to venture out into the cold and the snow, the unending snow, and to be physically present gathered in this beautiful space. And welcome again to those gathered virtually via Zoom. At home, faithful, joined in the spirit with us here. We're glad to gather in whatever way we can in the service of worship at Broadway First Baptist Church. There are about, I'm gonna guess about 20, 22 or three of us here at Walnut and Honeyman. And leading us today, we have Grégoire Leblanc, um, otherwise known as Greg White, who has blessed us with his preludes uh, this week, last week, the week before and Kent Gowler, who will be helping lead us with music. John Hunt is our Zoom director, and Barbara Lyons, who has put a lot of effort, as she always does, into the selection of hymns, who will be sharing a message and leading us in prayer this morning. Since beginning work at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, I have been naturally spending time thinking about what human rights are all about. The first gallery that you walk into in the museum asks that question, what are human rights? And it's a rather dark place uh, filled with images and videos and um, people talking um, from all over the world, speaking about what they think human rights mean, um, equality, dignity, uh, being treated with respect, belonging. And then uh, out of that cascade of sound, in the darkness, you step off of some dark concrete and you notice the first shaft of natural light coming into the gallery. And you step onto a really rich golden hardwood floor. And you're in the space for indigenous perspectives. And there you encounter First Nations perspective on human rights. And the big takeaway there, at least for me, is that the answer to that question of what are human rights lies not only in ourselves as humans, but in the creation that surrounds us. That all the creatures that God has made with beauty, with intelligence, have a responsibility, a role to fulfill in God's creation and for their creator. So the emphasis is on responsibility as much as it is on rights. And so it is that we acknowledge, as is our responsibility, with gratitude, all of our relations on this territory of Treaty Number One, the Ininu, the Anishinaabe, the Oji Cree, the Dene, the Lakota, and our Métis neighbors, all of whom have striven to fulfill their roles in creation, who cared for this land, and who have shared God's bounty with us. Some announcements before we carry on with our time of worship together. You can find three announcements in today's bulletin, one of which tells us about what we can do with all those stamps on all those Christmas card envelopes we got in the mail a few weeks back. Contact Linda Dick about that. And just beneath that notice, we learn about what we can do to support young Christians in Canada, seeking to grow in their faith and serve beyond our country's border. Contact Peggy about that. And we appreciate the work that Susan puts into keeping us connected through our monthly newsletter. Send her your submissions using the email address shown in her announcement, also in today's bulletin. Next week, our worship service, and that is next week, John. Uh, next week's service will be hosted by John Hunt, and we will look forward to hearing a message from Matt Lorty. And now, here's Sheila with an announcement from the Church Finance Committee. It's interesting to be called a committee because <laughs> so many people on the committee. Um, you will all, for those receiving emails, will all have received uh, documentation yesterday regarding our finance meeting. A finance meeting has officially been called for Sunday, February 27th, following the regular service via Zoom or here in the sanctuary at approximately 1130. 
documents have been delivered for those who uh, are getting them manually. Some were delivered yesterday, some will be delivered today. If you do not receive them, please contact the church email or the church office by phone number. And any questions on the budget that is being proposed by the deacons can be sent to the treasurer's email, broadwayfirst.treasurer at gmail.com or the church phone number 783-4413. Uh, we have, just so everybody knows, those who are not in attendance, cannot join by Zoom, can register their vote of for, abstain, or against uh, via the church voicemail. That way we can register your voice, your name, and your vote. And that we ask to be done by Saturday, February 26th at 5 p.m. That allows us to include you in our vote the next day. Any questions, you're very welcome to contact me <clears throat> or Peggy Talbot or as I said, the church email or the phone number. The second announcement that I have is actually very uh, apropos to what Raymond was talking about. Lynn has forwarded some information for us about Tuesday, February 22nd. We will include this in next week's bulletin. Canada's Human Trafficking Awareness Day is set for that day. There will be an online um, event on Tuesday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. Please prayerfully support this uh, as we think of those who are used and abused in that, in that fashion in Canada. Anyway, blessings to you as we begin our service. Thank you, Sheila. Let's turn to worship. In Psalm 1, we read, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. This Sunday, we are considering to what extent we, as Christians, are asked to be devoted to our creator. The psalmist speaks of meditating on God's law day and night. Our Welsh hymn that closes our service, and I think of Viv every time we sing it, speaking, speaks of following a, God's guidance as though it were a cloudy pillar by day and a fiery pillar by night, by which we can constantly find our bearings. And in our closing hymn, we'll be praying in song that God take ch charge of our hands, our voices, our intellects, our silver, everything. In just a moment, we are reminded in our gathering hymn that this desire for full commitment is a calling not just for us, but for all people that on earth do dwell. This total, all-consuming, 24-7 devotion and desire to belong to our creator can seem, and I may be speaking only for myself here, but perhaps a few others among us, this all encompassing surrender can seem daunting or even unachievable. It has helped me upon reflection to think of this goal of achieving total devotion as something like putting on corrective lenses. Without my glasses, which are right now on my eyeballs, I can only see partially. Nothing beyond my arm is really clear, is really discernible, really understandable, or reliably what I think it is. My glasses or lenses are my eyes from the moment I wake up until I lay me down to sleep at the end of the day. I see everything more clearly through them. And so perhaps it is something like that with our desire to acquire the habit of seeking God's presence and guidance in everything we do each day as a way of looking at the world and at our neighbors and at God's creation with God's self-sacrificial love and strong commitment to justice. Will you pray with me? Dear God, 
your ways are good. Your love for us is unfailing. You know everything about us. Help us to desire to know everything about you, your law, your word, your example as seen in scripture and in those who seek to follow you with their whole hearts. May your spirit sanctify our thoughts, our words, our deeds. May we worship you in spirit and truth today and always, enabled as we are by your saving son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gathering hymn is found in the Book of Praise, number 65, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. Uh chapter 17, verses 1 to 13. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, inscribed with a flint point on the tables of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. Even their children remember their altars and Asherah poles, beside, beside the spreading trees and on the high hills. My, mount, my mountain, the land, and your wealth, and all your treasures, I will give away as plunder. Together with your high places, because of sin throughout your country. Through your own fault, you will lose the inheritance I gave you. I will enslave you to your enemies in a land you do not, do not know. For you have kindled my anger and it will burn forever. This is what the Lord says. First, is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. 
That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in parched places of desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful, but above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Like a partridge that hatches eggs it, didn't, it did not lay, and those who gain riches by unjust means. When their lives are half gone, their riches will desert them. And in the end, they will prove to be fools. A glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, is a place of our sanctuary. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Thank you. necessarily agree with me but I've always loved winter even as a, a young child my mother used to have to drag my brother and I in to eat meals because we were so busy playing outside in the winter didn't matter how cold it got we were out there anyway let's pray before we uh, begin to look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Father we just thank you for everything that's been said already this morning we thank you for Raymond's words and for the words of the songs and for Ibarco and Carlos and the way that they read Jeremiah 17 to us we thank you we thank you for your word we thank you for the fellowship of the body thank you for the communion of the saints and uh, just we pray as we now look into your word that you would 
just bind our hearts together, open our minds, open our ears, our hearts to receive the truths. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would descend in your power and might and just really just bless us this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. So the uh, lectionary has taken us to Jeremiah chapter 17. Uh, it actually, uh, the lectionary only called for verses 5 to 10, but when I started looking, I thought, no, we need some context. And then I started looking further and thought there's some marvelous <laughs> verses from 11 to 13. So we're going to throw them in. And, and, uh, and I'm going to be honest up front, there's so much in this passage that we're just skimming the surface this morning. And, um, it, you know, just a, a Jewish person would find so much more in, in this passage than uh, us Christians that kind of neglect the Old Testament. And uh, the whole thing of judgment and this, this theme's running throughout this. I've just come back and, and uh, we need chapter or we need verse one and we need verse 13 to complete the whole um, picture that Jeremiah was uh, painting here. And so we're going to uh, take a stab and see how we manage to do it. Uh, and, uh, and then at the end, we're gonna, I'm gonna have confession time. God's been really speaking into my heart this week. And so you guys get to, to uh, hear my confession and uh, what I'm planning to do about it. So it's always great when God speaks to us, even if it's not necessarily the nicest thing in the world that he tells us. But anyway, so let's take a look at Jeremiah. So who is Jeremiah? He's the weeping prophet. He was prophesying at the end of Judah before they were carried into, uh, into captivity into Babylon. He started in the reign of King Josiah, who which we know was a good king, right? King Josiah was a person who um, started reading the word of God again and, and tried to bring the good things of God back into, um, into daily practice because Judah had become very sinful. And that's really the first five, or first, sorry, the first four verses really talk about how sinful Judah had become. Israel has already, by this point in time, gone into captivity to Assyria. And, um, and Judah is now facing the same fate because as sinful as the northern kingdom was, the southern kingdom thought, we can be even more sinful and we're going to get away with it because we've got this covenant with God and it's going to protect us from destruction. So we have a very arrogant a nation uh, uh, a lot of idolatry. It, it talked about the Asherim poles and the, the high places and their altars. Uh, they were very idolatrous people at this point in time, a very immoral people, because of course, with all these uh, temples and, and false uh, gods, there was a lot of immorality there. Their temple prostitutes and, you know, on and on. They just were not a good people at that point in time and God is saying you know what judgment will come because judgment must come evil cannot stand in the presence of God and 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 when there is sin in the camp judgment must come and and so that's the situation uh that we're, we're finding ourselves in you know that uh, you know because it's in verse one it talks you know that their sins are engraved on the on their hearts with a, a diamond point, and we know diamond is one of the hardest minerals, right? So if you want to really etch something in, you'd use a diamond to etch it in. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, we're talking about a really, really sinless uh, uh, nation. We've got children who have been steeped in idolatry since, you know, being tiny and they're, they've grown up to be a very, even more idolatrous uh, generation than the one before them. So things are not good in the southern kingdom of Judah at this point in time. Um, and, and Jeremiah continued to prophesy until even after they went into exile. And he, he, he had a terribly hard calling, <laughs> but he was faithful to the end, you know? He, uh, I don't know how many times they tried to kill him. Uh, and, and yet he continued to weep for the nation. He never lost, you know, that call of God on his life to, to speak to the nation of, and say, listen, you, you got to come back to God. You got to come back to God or something awful will happen. And, um, you know, and as I was reading, I was looking at my notes last night and I was thinking, man, 
there's so much judgment in here. And if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, where it's talking about the blessings and cursings in the Mosaic covenant, like there's just so much in here, but we're going to kind of, hopefully I'll do justice. And at the end of, of the day that uh, we will have had a chance to examine our own hearts because the question is, is how is our hearts health? Because <laughs> Judah's heart health was not good at this point in time. And, and so we have the prophet crying out, thus says the Lord. And he talks about cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength and his heart turns away from the Lord. And what does it mean to be cursed? That's the root word is to execrate, which means to feel or express great loathing for, or to declare to be evil or detestable. So when we're talking about someone being cursed, I mean, we are being declared that that thing is evil, that thing is detestable. So these are very strong words. And, and it, you know, it talks about the man who trusts in other men rather than going to God and trusting in God, that he, he's like, you know, a shrub in the desert, um, you know, in the parched places of the wilderness and in inhabited salt land. His life is so barren. I was thinking, I grew up in, in East Central Alberta on the banks of Sullivan Lake. Sullivan Lake is 40 miles of alkali. It's totally devoid of any life. Usually you go play in the stream and you take a scoop of water out and there's wrigglers and all kinds of creatures. If you take water from Sullivan Lake, there's nothing. You don't need even need, looking underneath a microscope, there's absolutely no life in it because of this, the alkali in the environment. And, and it's, it's absolutely, it's such a desolate place. In fact, a few years ago when they wanted to make a movie about the tundra, they actually filmed it in East Central Alberta on the, on the shores of this lake because it's such a desolate place. And, you know, as kids, we would go there and just be in awe of how, how barren it was. And that's what, you know, the, the man who trusts in other men and in himself and doesn't trust in God, that's what he's like, devoid of life. And it even, you know, goes so far as to say that, uh, you know, he can't even see when a brighter day is coming because He's, he's so far gone. He's so barren. He's so devoid of life that, that even a sense of hope, it doesn't exist for him anymore. And so that's the man who is cursed by God. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be in that camp. And then he contrasts it with, you know, he says, blessed is the man or the one, if we want to be more politically correct. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water. And, and then he, it, Jeremiah almost basically quotes uh, from Psalm, uh, Psalm number one, which was actually the lectionary uh, Psalm for this week. And, you know, that, that whole image of if we're trusting in God, we're like a tree planted by water. And, and we all know if you go down to the river and you have the most magnificent trees because they always have water. And, uh, and it's, you know, I, I got to thinking it's kind of like like right now in Winnipeg or in southern Manitoba, we're in quite a drought cycle. And like I know this year our apple tree didn't produce, our neighbor's apple tree didn't produce. Like there was the land was is really starting to suffer from the lack of water. And it makes you realize just how wonderful um, the uh, presence of water in our life, how important it is. And, and when we get right down to the very bottom, we're going to have that declaration that, that God is a source of living water. And we know that from John's gospel, you know, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman. And he says, if you take from the living water that, that I'm going to give you, you will never thirst. And so that's, so we really need to choose. Are we going to be the, the man who trusts in other men or in, in, in horses or chariots or any of these things? Who, whose life is very barren? Or are we going to trust in God and have a fruitful life? And I know that's so, um, it's such an unpopular thing to think about because our society has become so secular and so determined that we're going to do it. We're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstrings. But the word of God tells us that's no way to live. If you really want to live, you need to let God 
have your life like Raymond talked about this morning. I really appreciate your opening comments, Raymond. And, and you know, we, we, we need to be reminded it's, it's all about God. And if we give God control of our life, we will flourish. You know, it's not, there's no promise you're not going to become a billionaire or whatever, but you know, we're going to flourish where we're planted and we're going to be able to do what he has created us to be. We're going to live in the fullness that he has created us to be. And uh, I'm just going to, um, there's, I, I've, I've been reading as I read through the Bible each year and I was reading in Proverbs and I'm just going to uh, read two verses from chap Proverbs chapter four, because it, it paints another picture. We've seen the picture of the, the barren land and the fruitful land along the river. And here's, a, here's another description of the difference between the righteous and the wicked, okay? And it says here in uh, verse 18 of chapter four of Proverbs, it says, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness, they do not know over what they stumble. So if you're not into agrarian pictures of deserts and waters, then we do have that picture of the darkness and the light. And that uh, if we uh, choose to go with God, that we will live in the light. And we don't have to worry about stumbling over things in the dark because Jesus is the light of the world, isn't he? Yeah, such an incredible thing. Uh, but then the passage goes on and it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately ill. Who can understand it? The only question in this whole passage is, you know, that question, who can understand the heart? And of course the answer is that God can, right? And uh, and uh, if, if, if God can uh, somehow have our heart, then he can address that incurable disease that is our heart, right? Uh, because our hearts are, are full of self-deceit you know, and, and so it affects our ability to discern good from evil, right? And we really need God to come into our lives and to speak truth into our lives so that that self-blindness that we have, the self-deceit can be removed and we can see things God's way. And, and so we, we need to allow God to search our hearts and minds because it says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds, which of course, you know, the uh, Judah is <laughs> going to be carried off into captivity in just a little while, in like 40 years, and, and because they are paying for the fruit of their deeds. But, you know, really we need to be hearing, you know what, we need to make sure that we live our lives in such a way that God is able to bless us and not curse us. I guess, yeah. God knows our ways and, and, and we can trust God to judge us. God is the righteous judge. God can never make a bad judgment. And so he's trustworthy. We, it's okay to say to God, okay, take my life because we know that whatever God does with our life, if we truly give it to him, will be good. It's not that you no know, hard times will come. It's not that bad things will not happen to us, but whatever comes, Whatever happens, God is there to see us through. And so why, why, why live any other way? I guess it's a question, right? We need to just go with God and to allow him to dig deep into our hearts and to, uh, to convict us. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. I'll tell you, like I said, I had this experience with God this week and I'm trying to be obedient. But anyway, so then uh, let's carry on. So we've already, we've had narrative, we've had some poetry that uh, Iparco and Carlos, thank you for reading. <laughs> Sorry about such a hard part <laughs> passage for Iparco. <laughs> anyway, we love you guys. So, uh, but, uh, and now we have this mini parable in, in chapter, in verse 11. It talks about this partridge that gathers a brood that, he did, that she did not hatch. And apparently the Jews had this notion that the partridge would go around and steal eggs from other nests and bring and put in their nest. I'm not sure how they would carry these, 
eggs, but, and there's no, the naturalists have never found this to happen, but for some reason, they believe that partridges would go steal eggs from other nests. But then when these uh, hatchlings, you know, would emerge and, and it's kind of like the ugly duckling, you know, it was thought it was a duckling, but it didn't fit in. It was all really awkward until one day they saw the swans in the sky and realized that he's actually a swan. So then these, these eggs that the partridge had has out, one day they would realize that they're not partridges and they would leave them up, right? And so it, it, it's this little parable of, of wealth that's gained in illegal ways, right? If you go out and steal somebody else's money, it's not gonna, in the end, end well for you. You might think, okay, things are okay. I, I got this money and I'm all cool, but he's not trusting in God. And, and, and our wealth will flee from us, right? In the midst of his days, his riches will leave him. And in the end, he will be a fool. And let's talk a little bit about what a fool is. Because when the Bible uses a word fool, it's, it's, it's a very strong word. It's, you don't want to be called a fool by God. Uh, a fool is somebody who disregards God's word and says in his heart, there is no God. So we're getting back to this barren life, right? This life that is, is devoid of, of, of all that makes living pleasurable. We need, and, uh, and you know, when we, we live in a world where there is so much uh, foolishness. And, uh, and in fact, I think I'm just going to tell you now what God's been saying to me, because it really ties in with being a fool. And I need to confess to you guys that God has called me out as a fool this week, as I studied through this. And I need to make amends. And so um, it started with a dream one night. And I dreamt, uh, uh, there's prayer ministry that takes place in England, a fellow that, uh, that leads a group at Trinity Baptist, so I know him. And then he just married a Korean girl who led a prayer ministry in Korea. And now they've buried and they merged and their ministries are merged. And in this dream, they needed somebody from Alberta to join them. And of course, who's from Alberta, right? So, okay, so I say, okay, God, obviously I need to up my uh, intercessory prayer. And, uh, and then of course, uh, our prime minister has been in the news so much this since his freedom convoy and and you know and I'm looking at him and and I just in my heart I'm saying that man does not look well you know because the stress he's under has to be huge right and God said to me how come you're not praying for him <sighs> and what can I say I'm guilty I'm guilty as charged I have not been faithfully praying for my prime minister. And God says, you need to pray for him. And he's really broken my heart. When I see Justin Trudeau on the TV and he shows me the brokenness of that man. And, and, and he's just, and I've become so angry over the way the, the media is portraying him. You know, they're calling him a coward and they're saying he sold his soul to the devil and that he's incapable of telling the truth and all these things. And it's really making me angry. And while those things may be true, and he, I mean, he's far from perfect, just like all of us, but God is really saying to me, you know what? It's time to get down on your knees and pray for your prime minister. And so then when we pray for, uh, I had found this really nice prayer of blessing that I want to pray over Canada today, but you know what? When I'm done my sermon, we are going to pray for our prime minister. We're going to ask God to bring healing into that man's life and to restore him to the man that God created him to be. We're going to pray for wisdom and strength and, and whatever, whatever he needs. We're going to do that. And I'm hoping some of you will stand with me and do that. But God just, you know, like he just reminded me, we got to look after him and we have to respect him. We need to, we need to be, of, of people that, of people of respect really is what it boils down to because there's so much disrespect anymore. And uh, so he's telling me, you know what? You gotta get, you gotta up your game. And I'm hoping some of you will join me in it. But that's my, that's my confession. And that's what I wanna do. And, and, um, and I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing to be reminded that it's a terribly hard time to lead 
and that we need to be praying for our leaders. And I don't care if you ever voted for Justin Trudeau or whether you vote for him every time you get a chance. It's, we still need to pray for him. And, and that's what we want to do. But anyway, let's just take a look at these last uh, a couple of verses because it paints such a beautiful picture of God. You know, like God is seated in the heavenlies. He's seated on a throne and he is the righteous judge. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, he is the hope of Israel. He is our hope. But then, you know, he, he talks, you know, oh, Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the earth. And it's, so we get back to the, you know, in verse one, we talked about, you know, writing on our hearts with that diamond point, etching it in our sins. And it's really getting back to, if our names are just written on the ground, whirlwind comes by, blows it away. Heard a sheep come by, that writing is gone, right? It's, it's, it's not secure. The only place our names need to be written is in the book of life. And, and so God is really crying out and saying, you know, here I am, I am a fountain of living water. Here I am prepared to give you everything you need to live the life that I've created you to be, but you turn your backs on me. And he said, come back and come back and, uh, you know, and, and let's get your name written in the book of life. I was, uh, talking with a, a friend, I think just last week, and we were talking about the great right throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. And, and this guy, and my friend said, well, I'd like to be there. And I said, no, I said, I don't want to, I don't want to be there. It's going to be a terrible time. Uh, and, and, you know, and the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, that's going to be the saddest day in the history of mankind. Because I thought, you know, the day that uh, the serpent de deceived Eve and shade of the apple and man fell was a sad day. But in the next chapter, God's already revealed his plan. You know, Jesus is coming and he's going to crush Satan. That was already there. And then we, you know, we think of the day that Jesus was crucified. It was a terribly sad day, but there was hope because Jesus had said, you know, you destroy this temple in three days, it will be rebuilt. And so even though Jesus suffered that, horrible death on the cross for us there was always hope you know it was such a terrible day the earth shook and 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 the sun darkened and everything but there was hope and we celebrate that hope every easter you know with the sunrise and knowing that jesus has come back to life but on the day of judgment there is no hope if your name is not written in the lamb's book of life you have no hope and it's devastating. And so I guess, you know, if there's ever a message that we have for the world, it's that you need to get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life so that at the final judgment, which will come, we will be saved, you know? And it's a matter of, you know, going and being with Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth and that you know, the river and you've got the trees along the stream with healing, that whole picture of the man by the stream being like the trees along the stream, as opposed to an eternity away from God. And uh, I don't know, I guess, I'm so thankful that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I mess up at times and God calls me to account like he did this week but I know that I can trust him. I know that he is the fountain of living water and whatever happens in my life, a good, bad, whatever, he's there for me. And that's the message that we have for our world, a world that needs to hear that message. And so let's, let's be faithful in prayer. Let's be faithful in, in, in declaring the truth of God's love and, and goodness at the same time of his justice, right? I mean, Raymond talked about God's justice. God is just and he will judge us. We know that. We just need to make sure. And, you know, they, they say that there's a revival coming where there'll be more than one billion, at least one billion with a B saved. And, and you know, I was thinking, you know, Wolseley, if, if that would be about one in every seven people on the earth will be saved. And just think if one in seven people in Wolseley was saved, 
we wouldn't have any trouble filling this church. We'd have to empty out the balcony of all those drums and that, dust the seats up so that people would flock in. And we're, we're at the cusp of an amazing movement of God. God has great plans. And, and I think we need to decide, are we gonna go with God? We're gonna run with God or are we gonna trust in man? And I don't know, pretty obvious to me what the right choice is. So I just wanna encourage you all, you know, if we can to gain together, if we begin to pray together, to just support one another, God can use us in glorious ways. And there can be a glorious future for this church, uh, for this city, for this nation, for the world. But we need to just make sure that our hearts are where they should be. And so we're going to sing, uh, Take My Life and Let It Be, which is, like Raymond already said, it's just a real song of dedication to God. And uh, so I invite you to join us as we sing. It's 317 if you want the hymnal. So take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. give the benediction I just want to say that if any of you ever want somebody to pray with my phone number is in the directory and I'd be more than happy to pray with you and my social calendar is not terribly booked these days so I'm sure I can fit you in but I'm going to uh, for the benediction we're going to go to Psalm 32 and uh, just remind ourselves of the great God that we have it says many are the sorrows of the wicked but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord so now as we go, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. Amen.